Doug, stand-up physicist. And I'm wearing this ref thing because somebody recommended this book to me. Okay, What Einstein Did Not See by Thomas Sills. And so I am going to give you my opinion of this particular book. Um, I mean, I'm an ultra-orthodox fringe physicist. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that I accept a whole heck of a lot of all the stuff that, that is in standard physics and, and all the, the standard tools, um, but I try to clearly define any place I'm trying to question and see if I can do something uh, new and novel. Uh, but I'm pretty conservative, uh, at least for fringe physicist types. Um, and in my role as ultra-orthodox kind of person, I'm also a skeptic, which means that if somebody says, hey, I've got an idea, uh, like an email happens a couple of times a year, I will say, hey, nothing personal here, but this is why I do like uh, what you're doing, or I don't. And so far, actually, it's always been I don't, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I'm not going to try and change your mind, because I know you've invested a lot of effort, uh, but this is why I can't endorse it. So the take-home message right here is, I would say, this book is probably not worth your time. Because I don't think he really understands special relativity so well. He understands a lot of it, and unfortunately, that's not good enough. You really have to put it all together or it doesn't kind of work. So what I always recommend every single time is that people go out and buy this book, Space Time Physics by Taylor and Wheeler. So who are these guys? Well, Wheeler wrote this book with Thorne, uh, Taylor, Thorne, and Wheeler. And yeah, no. This is on general relativity. This is, this book is insane, <laughs> okay? But this led to the revival of general relativity as an area of study, because clearly there was a lot to study. <laughs> um, and you go, whoa, that guy, that guy probably knew his stuff incredibly well. Why is he writing a book that, uh, this, uh, this, this book, that can probably be understood by, say, a high school, a motivated high school uh, student can do this, or somebody 10 years out of uh, college and still love physics. He got together with, uh, with Edwin Taylor, who was a teacher, and he said, can we get at the real core of it? And what they decided to do is they tr decided to emphasize things that don't change. That is what is called an invariant. So special relativity is taking this Egyptian idea of, you know, a distance is the, uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, that always doesn't matter where you're surveying that from. Um, if you're talking about two points, you're going to have to, uh, end up with the same distance. What Einstein did was he modernized that by putting, adding in a t squared, okay? Uh, except that the T squared also has a minus sign between the T and, and the space parts. And that minus sign has a lot of fun consequences. Okay, so that's what he did. He emphasized, it, I mean, they emphasize in this book, the invariance. But if you go to graduate school, they'll emphasize transformation laws, which is a perfectly fine thing to do. But to me, I actually try and look at it three different ways. <laughs> that is, though they're the things that do change, they're the things that don't change. And then there's a transformation law that allows you to tell, to go between the two, okay? Uh, and say, hey, these are going to change, these aren't going to change, and, and figure things out. And that's not always done. Uh, for example, people say, hey, the speed of light is something absolutely everybody agrees to, which is true. But then what? does change, right? If that doesn't change, what does change? What does change is the frequency and the wavelength. I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah! If you start walking towards a light source uh, and somebody else walks away, you're going to say, hey, the, uh, the frequency is higher 
and the, the wavelength is shorter, and you take the ratio and you go, oh, but the speed of light is the same, and the person walking away is going to say the wavelength's longer and the frequency's lower, and you take the right ratio and you go, hold it, that didn't change either. <laughs> okay, so we have the thing that doesn't change, the speed of light, the two things that do change, and how about the transformation law? The transformation law is known as the relativistic Doppler effect, and I could write it down, but it might scare people, so I won't. Um, but that, to me, is always the complete picture. And it's super easy to spot. It's like, did they tell me everything? Like, like they'll talk about, oh, this seems appears to be contracting, okay? And then what, uh, like, lengths are contracting, and times are getting shorter, and you go, okay, but what is the invariant? The invariant is that t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. That's the invariant. And it turns out something called the Lorentz transformation is, you know, how that kind of all works out. Okay, so let's get to this book. And, um, and he's having trouble understanding um, the, the issue of um, time dilation. Actually, it's a problem that he doesn't talk about length uh, contraction at the same time, which you should, because when you're dealing with space-time, you always should deal with space and time, but fine. He's, he talks about time di dilation, and he's really kind of messing that up with the twin paradox. Ah, uh, first of all, I hate that name, <laughs> okay? It shouldn't be called paradox. I mean, it's a label, okay? It's the twin problem. We, we've got the math totally worked out. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this book, uh, it, he, he's got a section devoted uh, to the subject, and I think he does a reasonably good job. It, it is a confusing thing to explain to people, um, but it's, it's bad to compare the time contraction, uh, time dilation, to the twin problem, because time dilation happens when, you know, I'm looking at somebody's clock, they're looking at my clock, and it's completely symmetrical. You know, I say, your, your clock is getting, uh, beating too fast. And he'll look at mine and say, no, your clock is beating too fast. And actually, that's true in the sense, of, let's be clear here, your watch is always working normally. His clock is always working normally. It's just that when I look at his clock, I say it's beating too fast. When he looks at my clock, he says it's beating too fast, okay? And we're going to have a disagreement about our rulers, too, okay? That not my rule. My ruler's fine. His ruler's fine. Me looking at his ruler, hmm, that's where things show up. Him looking at my ruler, that's where things show up. But when we ever we calculate an interval, a t squared, minus uh, x squared minus y squared minus z squared, we're going to agree to each other. That's the thing we agree on, the interval. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's very reciprocal kind of thing. The story with the twin getting in a rocket ship, firing off to some distant point, turning around, coming back, and the twin is younger, that's no longer symmetrical. Well, why is that? The reason is that we, you know, I, I just said, you know, and they turn around. Like, it's no big deal. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's not a big deal for me. Well, I can go back and come, come back. It's like that, that. That's not a big deal, right? Well, except it actually requires energy to do that, okay? And it requires so little energy, nobody cares, okay? Uh, but in this uh, twin problem, the amount of energy that goes to getting, to turning around, is like insane. <laughs> it's not like small. And, and, and it, it turns out that, that, that there's a benefit to, to putting an insane amount of energy into your journey. Okay? The, the person who stays on the planet, uh, they don't use any energy. <laughs> they just hang out there. But the person who goes in a rocket ship first has to get up to that speed, which takes an insane amount of energy, and then turning around, it really gets it gets crazy, and then they come b back, you know, that's 
while they're traveling at a constant velocity, that's okay. But and then they got to slow down again. Another crazy huge investment of energy. Well, there's a benefit to that, and the benefit is you're a younger person, <laughs> so you can only uh, get the benefit of of the of, of the rocket twin if somehow um, you have a rail, really a crazy, crazy powerful rocket. All right, so anyway, um, okay, so I'll just go through here and, and f point out a few things. Um, okay, so I think one of the biggest problems is that I see him keep on talking about space. And look at the title, it's Space Time. You, you really, if you don't think about space-time, well, what, hold it, what goes into space-time? Does space go into space-time? Not really. Does time go in? No, not really. Only space-time goes into space-time. What does that mean? That means events. That had a, a location, an X, Y, and a Z, and a time, you know? So you need both of those, or you're not going to understand it like at all. You're going to have a major conceptual problem. And I can see this as I read it. He keeps thinking about space without time in there like always. And it's always got to be there or you can't make logical sense of it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what else we got in here. Um, well, actually, this this was like, like I, I, I do this because I get rewards for me, okay? And he talked about this point where he said, you know, matter occupies only a small region compared to empty space. Uh, he's quoting from Eddington. Okay. And I should say this guy has over like 30 pages of references. I know he takes this seriously. Uh, I know he's invested time and in reading in this, this, this kind of thing. But that quote from Eddington to me was like, <laughs> I had a nice epiphany. Okay. And it's like, so what could go into space-time? I've been kind of hammering at this guy and saying, what goes into there are events, okay? And what kind of events go in there? Uh, well, things are not really jumping around here. Uh, we're, uh, it, things are going in at low speed. And if you have low speed, what that really means as the, is the amount of uh, change in, in space is small compared to changes in time. Changes in time are huge, okay? So my thought was that because everything in this room, uh, everything I've ever had in contact with uh, is low speeds, that's going to uh, lead to um, a small volume of events in space-time. In other words, nothing's going to be, it's going to seem like, you know, there's almost nothing there which is what happens when you fire particles at uh, uh, subatomic particles at, 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 at uh, gold foil or something like that. It's like, there's nothing here. It's all low speed. It's low density of events is at least maybe why that's so. Of course, it might not be, but <laughs> it was fun to think about. Okay. Um, all right. So what else do we got? Um, so... He then goes in chapter three uh, into uh, talking about uh, scalars and vectors. And this is actually close to my research heart, <laughs> okay? I have been investigating how much new physics we can do with quaternions, and the answer is not a lot, but maybe something, okay? And the thing about a, a quaternion, uh, which is a number which has four parts, is that the first term is a scalar, and the set, other three are a vector. In fact, those words all came from Hamilton, along with div, grad, curl, and all that stuff, when he was describing what goes on with quaternions. So it's like, wow, you are so set to, to go running with uh, quaternions. Uh, but he then decides to take, uh, and so in my point, my research is saying, yeah, you know, time is obviously a scalar quantity, or time like things like energy is kind of like, uh, a time time-ish sort of thing. You you don't point to yeah it's seven seconds over there. Except this guy's 
brought up the, this issue of scalar and tensor and said, I want to come up with a time that, that does act like a vector. And, uh, oh, that didn't, that didn't sit well with me, uh, as we say. Okay. Um, so, in books like this, you're going to, uh, at least my experience has been, you read something and you just go, what? I, that makes literally no sense to me. Uh, and, you know, it's like that even in, in, in uh, technical fields where you just don't understand it at all. He says here, the total speed of all objects in four dimensions is C, the speed of light. It's like, really? Things that have mass don't go with the speed of light. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a little, like a totally basic thing. Uh, this fact applies regardless of the object's condition of motion in three-dimensional X, Y, Z, S space. And it's like, I don't believe so. Uh, and, you know, you, you hit one of those speed bumps and, you know, you kind of stop and just say, I completely disagree with that. Um, I know you wrote it down. I know you're serious about it. Uh, but that's kind of where I stop and say, that doesn't make any sense to me, like, at all. Um... And he, he has this uh, idea of universal time. Universal time should be synchronized and isochronic measurement by everyone in a four-dimensional universe. And it's just like, let's go back to the space-time physics book. Because <laughs> one of the themes that shows up over and over again is that simultaneity is not something we all agree about. Now, I can kind of show this by, um, let's think about two events that are simultaneous um, like that. Now, let me upgrade them. Let me make these two events actually be created by a femtosecond uh, uh, laser. <laughs> so they're really super short, okay? Uh, and we have cameras, and uh, like this camera, let's say we upgrade this so it can take a picture of a femtosecond. Uh, femto second laser and we get picture evidence that in fact those clicks happened simultaneously and we're all super happy except that somebody rides by on a bicycle with exactly the same kind of high-tech uh, um, equipment they actually come from behind and when this happens that guy because he's traveling on a bicycle and this one is closer to him than this one He's going to see this one slightly before this one, even though we see it at the same time. This stupid bicycle is messing it up, okay? So events are not, well, you can have, it, have events be simultaneous, but you can't have everybody, everybody in the universe agree on that. In fact, when that guy continues on his bicycle down the road, and we curse him for messing up our nice simultaneity, and he... And we repeat the experiment, because we're uh, experimentalists, and we repeat it. He's now going to say this one happened first, because it's now closer to him as he's biking away than this one. Okay? That's really well understood in special relativity. And so this idea of this uh, universal time, uh, again, I'm not going to convince him that it is not worth pursuing. Uh, but I, I'll say that's like a point that I will not agree with him on, and uh, we can uh, respectfully uh, go our separate ways. Okay, so, um, yeah, and he starts talking about something going at 60 hertz, and that everyone everywhere measures the frequency in the same way. And it's like, did he forget about the Doppler effect that, you know, people are going to disagree about um, that sort of thing, and it's like, so I must admit, I, I did stop reading carefully at, uh, by page 38 or so, 37, uh, and then what I did was I started flipping through the book, uh, looking for equations, because that's another, I mean, he's got some, which is good. There are lots of people in the fringe who don't write, like, any equations. <laughs> that's, a, that's a warning sign, people. Um, uh, this is not all philosophy. Uh, a lot of it involves, uh, a lot of physics involves calculations. And the reason I, I do, did that is because, you know, like the, the twin problem is something you can calculate, okay? And 
I did not sense that any such calculation was done. I mean, he came, comes up with two different ideas for what time is, uh, and he doesn't do a calculation of the twin problem. In other words, if you say that's the big problem, then you better come up with a big solution, okay? Because in Taylor and Wheeler, they do actually have a problem devoted to doing a calculation on that sort of thing, and they, it, it does work out, okay? And this says it's a big problem and doesn't do the calculation. Okay, I think I'll, I'll end with one final uh, comment, which um, an assertion that I find is, is, is easy to make, uh, make wrong. Okay, so he shows, shows this, uh, let's see there, that picture, and he says that picture exists only in three, three dimensions of space. And it's like, hold on a second. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? It's persisting in time, okay? So that's essentially um, an important point to, to me anyway, is, is that, that, that a hat like this doesn't exist just in space. If it existed only in space, you wouldn't have a chance to see it, okay? But it exists in space and time, that's why you can see it. So, to me, space-time is not really hard, it's, in fact, really boring. <laughs> I see it, it's still there, it's being still there is, I got a time-like quality, and so you shouldn't make that big a deal about it, because it's actually not a big deal, all right? So anyway, uh, as I say, um, he put in a good amount of effort, uh, he, uh, he, he got it printed up well, um, but I don't think he understood space-time physics by Taylor and Wheeler well enough to justify other people investing time in looking at this work. All right, thank you very much.